Welcome everybody. Good evening. Um, I'd like to present my colleague uh, Jennifer Nimi and I'm David Arbulu. We're going to be your hosts tonight. Um, um, our subject that we're going to be covering tonight is on anxiety and working with children. So what's on our agenda for tonight? Well, we're going to be talking about anxiety and what it is. Um, we're going to be talking about what maintains anxiety. And we'll also dedicate a lot of uh, our discussion tonight on how we can support children who are struggling with anxiety. Towards the end of the packets, you'll also find a list of some resources. And we'll also leave some time towards the end for some Q&A. Okay. So what is anxiety? Well, before I can even answer that, I want to know from, from, the, from the group, from all of you, what is it that you guys, um, when you think about anxiety and your children, what comes up for you? What are some of the concerns that come up when you think about anxiety and your kids? Worry, like disproportionate worries. Worries? <laughs> yep. Worries? Mm -hmm. I have educated too, so I'm being my students. Um, uh, just really their ability to function in the social settings. Mm -hmm. school and, mm -hmm. and how they deal with their peers and life in general. Yeah. Yes. A meaning that's attached to an experience. A meaning that's ex that's attached to an experience. Yes. And most of the time, I think that negative experience is more stronger than the positive one. Yes. <laughs> and we're definitely going to talk about <laughs> negative, <coughs> negative thinking, negative thoughts that are kind of the high, highlights of anxiety. So yes, everything everybody mentioned, absolutely correct. Um, anxiety is one of the most common uh, mental health disorders that affects millions of people and is actually one of the disorders that sends most people to the hospital. Um, it's the most treatable and it's also the most widely researched uh, mental health disorder that we know of. Um, it's, it's also very easy to treat, and um, I think with uh, the, the different um, um, strategies that we'll, we'll talk about today, um, it's also something that parents can also learn how to support their children and apply some of the interventions that we'll be talking about later tonight. So anxiety has a lot of different names. It's, I think anxiety has been known forever. Um, but for the most part, when we, we talk about anxiety, um, we know it as an internal sense of worry, of dread, or fear. Kind of sounds like something Edgar Allan Poe would write about. Um, anxiety may or may not have a clear cause. Um, some people could develop it out of nowhere, and sometimes it could be connected to other mental health disorders or conditions. Anxiety can also be a very typical and normal response, right? Uh, for example, remember, remember a time when you were young and you had to talk in front of your classroom or you had to present something to your peers. Imagine, try to remember the, the, the sweaty palms, the, the butterflies in your stomach. That was anxiety. It was an uncomfortable, stressful situation that many of us experience. Some of us experience it on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, for some of us, it could be um, so overwhelming that it could be debilitating. And it could be so strong that it doesn't even let you experience the richness and the beauties of life. For example, leaving your house, going to school, meeting new friends, taking a test. So anxiety can be found in many different types of situations. And for the most part, a little bit of anxiety is not a bad thing. I like to view anxiety as, in, I like to cook a lot. So when I cook, I'm always thinking about like, well, how can I tie this into cooking? So the best way I can, I can try to link it is, for me, anxiety is like making a soup. And anxiety is like a little like salt. And so you want a little bit of salt to, have, to give it some flavor, but you don't want too much salt. Otherwise, 
soup is going to be all salty. <laughs> <laughs> so anxiety has a lot of different forms. And there's a lot of different variation and a lot of different manifestations of anxiety. Uh, some of the forms that we might know about are um, general anxieties or excessive worry. Um, forms of anxiety can take the place of uh, specific phobias. Some might include more physiological expressions like panic disorder. Um, other forms can take the shape of um, obsessive thoughts or um, beha certain behaviors, rep repetitive behaviors like compulsions. It may take the form of social anxiety. And it's also related to traumatic ex experiences or traumatic memories. Some common symptoms that are related to anxiety may include the following, um, expressed fears or worries, crying, feelings of irritability, oppositional behaviors. Some children might present as goofy um, or silly. Um, they may also present with emotional dysregulation. They may present with um, antsy or fidgety behaviors. They also might present with a lot of difficulties with concentration, self-doubt, fear, clingy behaviors with the parent. Some children also might present with some sleep disturbances, nightmares, night terrors. Um, some children also can present with repetitive behaviors, thoughts, or excessive questions, or ex ex excessive questioning. And some children might also present with, with panic, which is more of a physiological response that we'll, we'll definitely talk about later tonight. When we talk about anxiety, I like to, first I want to ask you guys, see if you can point it out. In this room, where can you find the nearest fire detector? Good job. Anywhere else? Well, that was really quick. Okay. Somebody's pointing up. See those little thingies up there? Little sprinklers. You ever wonder how those things work? Oh, yeah. yeah. They have one purpose in life. The purpose is to, is to shoot water everywhere and to scare every, everyone with the loud noise. In, in the same vein, anxiety kind of functions in a similar way. To understand how anxiety works, we have to dive into the brain into a very ancient architecture located in the very center of the brain. It's easy to locate the fire extinguishers and the fire detectors in here, but how can we locate these, the center in our brain? It's pretty simple. You grab your finger, your left finger, you point it at your ear, you get your right finger, and you point it at your left eye. And if you can, if you can imagine an imaginary like dotted lines, that place where they intersect is where you might find the amygdala. Now, the amygdala has its origins that go way back, back into time. Some people suggest that this is um, an inheritance that we had from our very early ancestors. The sole purpose of our amygdala is twofold. One is to save our lives if there's a perceived threat or danger in our environment. And the other role that it has is to create emotional memories. So we really should thank our amygdalas because it's basically what keeps us alive. It helps us to spot external and internal threats that may be dangerous and might not be dangerous. But just like the, the fire alarms, it doesn't know the difference. Its sole purpose is to just let you know that there's something out there that might be bad for your health. And you need to do something about that. So one of the things that our amygdala does is it does us the favor of sending signals all the way down to our adrenal glands. They're located right above our kidneys. 
And what ends up happening is that it releases a, a cascade of hormones that permeates our bodies. Those hormones are called cortisol, which is our stress hormone, and a, fa a nice word called uh, adrenaline that gets our, our blood pumping that makes our eyes widen, that gets us ready to, to run away or to fight against something that's gonna attack us. Another response could be to freeze. So our bodies are preparing for fight, for flight, and for freeze. And this is a very natural response that occurs in almost everybody in this room. There are some folks who have an amygdala that could be compromised due to a seizure or some type of really bad accident. And for some of those folks, um, what's curious is that they don't have the same sense of danger. And so oftentimes we have folks that have impaired amygdalas that end up getting into a lot of accidents because they don't realize the, the imminent danger that they can find themselves in. So this, this release of, of hormones in the body creates is a trigger that's detonated by something that the body is perceiving in the environment. Once the body releases these hormones, we notice specific body reactions, and we also notice certain changes in our thought patterns, in our visual and verbal thoughts. And this leads the person to behave in a certain way. So, for example, the other day I was walking my dog. Her name is Stella, and she's a very powerful breed. She's a, a Staffordshire Bull Terrier. I paid 100 bucks just to figure that out. <laughs> pretty, pretty much she's a bulldog. I mean, she's a little, you know, pit bull. And I remember one morning I was walking with her down the block. It was maybe 6.30 in the morning and I'm walking. And out of the corner of my eye, I noticed something. And I immediately stopped and I kind of jumped back. And then what I did was I inspected what it was. It turned out to be a part of a ship or like a boat that was parked in somebody's like driveway. And so I'm like, oh, okay, no danger. Keep on walking. Nothing happened. So the response was very quick. And it took me a second to figure out what it was, that it wasn't a threat. It was just a, a, a piece of wood that kind of looked weird to me. And so on my own, well, maybe unconsciously, my sense of arousal went up. But over, over the course of a few seconds, I was able to regulate my own body. And I was able to realize there was no danger. Go right back to walking. In some children that suffer from anxiety and panic, we could say that the, what they're experiencing is a hyperarousal in the amygdala, in the, limbic, in the limbic region. And some children who don't have the skills or the coping mechanisms to manage these uncomfortable feelings end up struggling with what we know as anxiety disorders. I wanna talk a little briefly in more detail about what these physiological feelings or responses might look like in the body. It's important to recognize them and it's important for children to understand them. A lot of times children will feel afraid, but they don't pay attention to these signals that, that they're sensing in their bodies. So one thing that parents can start doing is to help them understand, to understand what their bodies are telling them. So what are some common symptoms or, or sensations that a child could experience when they feel anxiety? Well, they could start breathing fast. Breathing, oh, sorry, breathing up here. They could start feeling butterflies in their stomach. They might need to go to the potty or the bathroom. 
They also might feel wobbly in their knees. They may feel their bodies very tense and rigid. They might start feeling overwhelmed and start to cry. They may start sweating. They may feel nervous or shaky. They might have a stomach ache or a headache. Another thing that we, we need to point out to them and that we also have to consider is that thoughts are also important. It's not just what the body is, is telling us, but we also have to notice what kind of thoughts are coming up for us. And thoughts matter. Somebody had mentioned something about negative thoughts. And a, a way that I like to, to, when I'm talking to children about thoughts, the first thing I say is, um, hey, do you know what an ant is? And kids are like, yeah. I go, well, what do you do when an ant comes into your home? I love it how some kids are so, they're so nice. They say, um, I pick up the ant and I carry it away. <laughs> and I'm like, wow, you're so nice. I wouldn't do that. <laughs> um, why do I mention ants? Because according to Dan Siegel, a person that I highly admire, um, he came up with an acronym called ANTS. Automatic negative thoughts. Automatic negative thoughts. What is it that makes them so automatic and so negative? Well, I think it's, I think it's the brain's way of, of, of looking for things that might not be there. And I think the brain has a way of anticipating. Some say that our brains are like anticipation machines. And that's a good thing because it helps us spot patterns. It helps us to recognize faces, situations, things that look familiar. Um, and so, but what happens is with anxiety is that the brain automatically assumes that something bad's gonna happen. And so that's why we call them automatic negative thoughts. If I can add yeah. to that. What we also like to, we also like to call them hot thoughts because they're so quick. They happen suddenly. Um, so for example, a child's about to get up and speak in front of their class and they have an automatic thought, automatic negative thought, the ant, everyone is going to laugh at me. So, but these are so quick, right? They kind of almost happen unconsciously, um, but it does produce nonetheless anxiety symptoms. So you'll see a lot of bodily cues to that too. Yeah. Thoughts are divided into two realms. The verbal, which is when I think what I'm going to say, and thoughts are also visual. As in this case right here. Imagine a child who's tucked in bed. It's late at night and they hear rapping, rapping on the window. Is that the, the raven? Nevermore? <laughs> Sorry, it's the Edgar Allan Poe. A lot of children automatically will imagine something outside their window. And the, the, the mind is very powerful and children will think there must be something out the window. There must be an intruder or a monster. I may not see it, but I know it's there. It feels real to them. And so part of our jobs is to, is to help children learn how to differentiate between what's a negative thought and what are positive thoughts. Here are some other problems that we might see with, with thinking. Like I mentioned earlier, the brain is an antici anticipation machine. It, it quickly wants to, to problem solve. That's a good thing and it could be a bad thing. One of the common errors that we notice is when a person, for example, is in an airplane. I don't know if anybody's ever experienced this, but I sure did. Um, I was in an airplane and I felt the, the chair started shaking. And the first thing that a person could think about is, I'm going to die. 
this plane is going down in a fiery crash. It's over. So the problem is, is that the, the mind sometimes has a tendency to overestimate. It sometimes tends to uh, jump to conclusions before the evidence has been collected. We also have a tendency to overestimate the consequences. For example, I don't know if anybody's ever seen the movie Carrie. Maybe this is not a good example. Um, <laughs> but every, they're going to laugh at you. They're going to laugh at you. And a lot of kids feel that way. You know, I'm going to present in front of my class and people are going to laugh at me. You know, or people are going to notice the error that I made or the mistake that I'm going to make. And so part of our job as therapists is to help children overcome these errors in thought. And we're going, tonight we're going to show everyone here how, as parents, you guys could do the same. You guys could also help your children learn and identify and challenge some of these errors in thought. And one of the last things I wanted to mention is that the, the whole focus, the whole idea of anxiety is to get away from what's dangerous. And so the ultimate goal for the person who suffers with anxiety is to avoid and to escape a situation that feels uncomfortable or that's potentially dangerous. Jennifer? Okay, I'm gonna talk about how anxiety is kept at bay, what's maintaining it. So there's various, very, there are a lot of variables here. So the first part is as parents, we, we have good intentions, right? We wanna help our kids. Um, sometimes part of that ends up uh, continuing the anxiety. So I'll talk about that. Um, as adults, you, um, you definitely don't wanna support a child avoiding a certain behavior. You want to be there to encourage as much as possible their ability to confront that behavior. And I'll get into that in a little bit. Um, other things that contribute to uh, what keeps anxiety at bay, thinking errors, what Debbie just talked about, the and, the automatic negative thoughts, overestimating the consequences and the probability that something bad is going to happen. So if a child doesn't learn how to reconcile those things. If the child is continuing to think that, you know, that dog is going to bite me, or I am, you know, going to have night terrors in my sleep if I'm alone or if I sleep in the dark. If we're not able to correct that um, through parental help or through, you know, a therapist or a counselor's help, most likely those thinking errors are just going to perpetuate. Um, the other thing is lack of coping skills. If a child is so anxious, most likely the child doesn't have a lot of coping skills. Some coping skills are innate. Uh, a lot of children just inherently know what to do to reassure themselves. So self-soothing, they gravita gravitate towards their fuzzy animals, um, seek reassurance from friends or talk to a family member. So if a child doesn't really have coping skills, there's no way for them to regulate that anxiety, if that makes any sense. Um, like I mentioned before, excessive reassuring. So sometimes as parents, we mean well, um, but part of that is we end up reassuring to the child is, you know, you're going to be fine or it's all in your head. You know, those things are not helpful, but as much as, you know, we think that they might be helpful, the child doesn't in the end learn to confront what they're fearful of. Um, and taking over, it's kind of tied to this. Um, basically, when you're taking over or you're kind of joining the child in avoidance, you're basically just rescuing or, or um, preventing the child from learning how to cope with that anxiety and how to learn from that anxiety. Any questions about that? Hi. So yes. you were saying, so sometimes we say, oh, it's all in your head, it's okay, you won't have the So those are actually are not helping you, it's actually telling them, not giving them the... Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. the question is, what are we supposed to say? <laughs> we'll get to that, I promise. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah, we will get to that. But, and that's a great question. Um, but basically, we're not allowing the child to learn how to confront it. 
So here's a little, um, I don't know what they call this. Um, model? A model, yes, the outcome of, of avoidance. So what, can you all hear me? Um, so what happens? So we have a child in a very difficult situation, right? And you guys can think of one as I go through this that maybe pertains to your child or someone that you know. Child becomes really anxious or starts freaking out about something, okay? What's the child gonna do? The child's just gonna avoid. The child's gonna do everything he or she can to not be in that situation, to ask mom and dad for help or teacher for help so that they are not in that situation, right? So what does that do in the end? Well, one, the kid's no longer fearful. They're, the kid's no longer anxious because they got out of it. The other thing is that the child continues to think that, you know, the dog or sleeping in the dark is dangerous. The child never learns that um, they can confront these situations and live through these situations in a healthy way. Okay. Here's a lovely graphic. So I might geek out a little bit. So we have anxiety here, we have time here. So over here we see when a child enters a feared situation, their anxiety skyrockets, right? If they avoid, what happens over time? Well, they'll be in that anxiety uh, stimulating situation. Again, the child avoids what happens over time. So basically, this is a negative cycle that continues. Um, and also, anxiety can generalize. So if a child is afraid of you know, one thing, most likely they're not developing the coping skills or the regulation to tolerate other fears, right? So, um, it's kind of a, a terrible cycle. So I'm going to show you this. What happens when we don't avoid? Or what happens when the child confronts um, distressing situations? Child enters a feared situation. When enduring the situation, it's very possible that the child's anxiety can get worse, right? But with techniques that we'll talk about in a little bit, eventually over time, the child's distress will decrease, right? So we'll talk about some things that uh, you as parents can do to help your children, um, as well as you know, in the community if your children seeking a counselor or a therapist. Now I, I leave it to David. Okay, thank you. For now. Thank you. Yeah, what to do with children who feel worried and fearful, dreadful of a situation. <laughs> There's a lot of things that we can do. And I think one of the, the most important things that as parents we can do is, is we could help them by developing a lot of important coping skills and strategies. Uh, for starters, um, it's, it's, it's important to get the basics, basics in there. Having a, a very steady routine. Um, routine. Somebody mentioned today, Pat. You know, I don't. I don't like talking to my to my parent about, you know, how I'm doing today. And I go, why? He's like, well, because it's so repetitive. You know, they ask me the same questions every day. How are you doing? I say, good. I go, well, you know, it's important for parents to know how you're doing. It's, it 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 establishes connection, and it's and routine gives us a sense of security. So part of routine that we want to establish with children is developing healthy sleep habits, um, eating good food, healthy food, getting enough physical activity, exercise. We want to expose them to family, parties, friends, little furry animals. Um, we want to get out into nature. You know, walk amongst the trees. Um, we also can help build on their strengths and their interests. This is a very key, important part because we're, we're using what they already know and what they like and what they're interested in. You know, Marvel Comics, check. Harry Potter, check. You know, all the things that they're really interested in, use that. Use that in, in, in how the characters move through their stories and get through it. So that's very, very important. Um, avoid overbooking of activities. 
I don't want to name any parents, but I know some parents <laughs> in the community that have a very tight schedule with their kids. You know, they go to school, but then after school, they have, you know, gymnastics, karate, swimming, tennis. Then they got to prepare for the SAT. And so there's a lot of, a lot of things that, that get packed into the week, which is good. Keeps kids entertained, keeps them focused, keeps them busy. But at the same time, it's important to leave some, some downtime for kids. And it's, it's good to have time for kids just to be a kid. This is a strategy I wanted to share with you all called the CALM strategy. CALM is an acronym for some things that a parent can do when a child is actively feeling arousal and, and anxious. So the first letter is C, which is for catch your breath. So it's very important for the parent when you feel that your child is feeling anxious and worried, it's important for the parent to also feel calm and relaxed. I'm going back to the airplane image, but what is it that the, the airline people tell you in the event of a water landing? What will fall down from the ceiling? Oxygen mask. And I always ask parents the following question. If you're sitting with your child, who puts on the mask first? The parents, yes. Because if you give the child the oxygen first and you faint, who's gonna make the choices for the child? So it's very important that the parent always maintains calm in the midst of a storm, okay? So take a moment, pause, reflect. Take a moment to think about how you're going to approach the child in the midst of an, of an anxiety situation. Plan a response. Be mindful about how are you going to talk to your child about this particular situation. And how can we take the opportunity to learn from this moment in time? The A is for accept the feeling, accept the negative feelings that the child might be having. Wait patiently and respond with, I see, um, okay. <laughs> That's all you gotta do for, for just a little bit. I see, okay, uh-huh, hmm. I sometimes like to do this, hmm, hmm, I see. This is serious. Serious business. What we want to do, and this is important, we want to acknowledge and validate the child's experience. Yeah, you're right, buddy. This is scary. Yeah, if I were in your shoes, I, 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 I can feel that too. I was there too. Yeah. We could also, L, label the emotions. Pal, you look really nervous. This is kind of scary, isn't it? Yeah. You could even make those weird faces with them too. Like, yeah, this is kind of scary. It's okay to be silly too. Silliness, being silly also helps. Laughter helps. Remember that. So watch a lot of comedies with your child. <laughs> And finally, M is for model the coping skills, right? Show your child how you remain calm and collected. Sometimes you could even say to the child, hey, you know, buddy, like I'm feeling kind of nervous today. You're an expert at this kind of thing. What do you think I should do? That, at that point, you can quiz them and see what, what they would recommend. It's funny because children oftentimes have a lot of great ideas for other people, but for themselves, they sometimes don't know what to do. But they're great at giving advice, right? Sounds familiar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So in, in terms of modeling coping skills, how are these kids getting anxious in the first place? 
what's going on, what meaning are they attaching to experience that then creates this sustained reaction? Is it, I mean, I'm sure there's many modeling of parents of being anxious. This is where you get to all turn into detectives, Inspector Gadgets, and Sherlock Holmes. The idea here is we want to know more. You know, a child might say something like, I don't want to go to school, Dad. I, do, I don't want to go. And you say, okay, uh-huh, mm-hmm, I see, okay. Can you tell me more? Can you tell me what you, th what, what you think might happen? And what we want to do is we want to elicit more info. You see the, I don't know, Dad, I'm just too scared. I don't know. They might say, I don't know. And that's okay if they say, I don't know. But don't take I don't know for an answer. I like to respond with, okay, you don't know, huh? Okay, well, take your time. We have all the time. Let's think about it together. Let's think about what's making you feel this way. So yeah, some kids might respond that way. They don't, they don't even know why they feel this way. And it's our job to, to reflect with them what, could be, what, what it could be and to ask them these open-ended questions. Mm -hmm. I think what I'm really asking is um, not in an episode of anxiety, but the home environment, school environment, silo environment, media, whatever it is. Yeah. What's creating this? Yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot. Yeah. We live in a very anxious world, society. Um, the media. Every time I, I don't even, I don't even watch the news anymore. I stopped. I stopped. I, I. Cold turkey, no more, I'm sorry. You know, um, there's so much. There's so much going on in the world. You know, there's so much going on everywhere. And so many children feel so much. Yeah. Jennifer? Um, maybe to, uh, to go back, uh, uh, your question is, like, how, do, how does anxiety form? I mean, what are right. the ways in which, so, you know, my ideas are, or from what I know based on research, there's no one root cause of anxiety. It can be biological, it can be environmental. There could be context in the environment that particularly stress the child out. Um, there, are, there are certain stressors. Maybe there was one instance uh, that caused a child to panic that then generalizes. Um, they obtain information from their parents, parental modeling. So it's a variety of factors. And so what David's saying is it's very important to kind of get a sense from your child what's going on. That way you can get a better sense of um, where the anxiety is stemming from, how long the anxiety has been going on for. Yeah. You know, I have a situation where actually a child is only three years old and starting uh, preschool. And the, uh, even the very first day before leaving the house, we started just crying. You know, one go. And over the two weeks, we were crying, <coughs> developing, like not able to sleep, and wake up in the middle of the night and say, I don't want to go to school. I don't want to go to Cape Town. I don't want to go to Cape Town. But, you know, when, you know, when you were talking about um, the coping mechanism when you are able to verbalize with them, that's one thing. But when a three year old child, when that anxiety actually came from. I know there are a lot of variety of reasons um, that we can help them, but at the same time for a three-year-old, how can we really help them to understand? A lot of children um, are nonverbal and have a hard time expressing verbally what they're feeling. Um, what we can do as parents is we can observe and notice how, how uncomfortable they feel. Uh, we can reassure them. Um, I think that um, there are other issues too, like sensory issues mm -hmm. that some children might have that maybe we're not aware of. Um, it could be something in the environment, like certain noise levels, or um, maybe, ha maybe being surrounded by too many children. Or maybe it could be that they experience a negative situation with a teacher or another adult in the school. Um, and that could be enough to make a child feel uncomfortable and insecure in a, in a particular environment. Mm -hmm. right? yeah. yeah, there's also a strong biological component. That's what we know from research uh, uh, with anxiety too. Um, so 
it's, it's hard for us to give an answer uh, based off of you know, one child's presentation. Um, in, in the end, or at the end of this presentation, we'll give maybe some recommendations for what to do, yeah. right? Yes. I knew a case that a kid, a uh, nonverbal kid, um, he was uh, very, very animated of not going to Walgreens. And everybody thinks that something happened in Walgreens, but what the mother discovered is the certain Walgreens, uh, they use chemicals to mm. clean it up. And he, he was very reactive to the, to the chemical where they- The chemical them. residue. <laughs> yeah. So it was very interesting. I, I think it's also important to remember that, again, going back to the inside of our brains, the amygdala plays a huge role in how children form anxiety. And it's, it's based on memories, a particular memory that a person might have, a situation, and combining what we're doing, a place, and the experience. It could be, for example, a child that, you know, they're, they're coming, grandma's coming to see them. And the child's so excited and they're running to, to grandma and they accidentally trip and fall and, and break their nose and they're bleeding. And the one thing that they remember is the bear. And as they grow up, for some reason, every time they see a bear, they feel very unsafe or they feel uncomfortable. They may not understand, you know, but the body somehow, it creates these connections that somehow it's, it's not easy to, to pinpoint. And I think that's part of the reason why anxiety is, is, is difficult to, to, to find out the origin. Do we have a question? Yeah. So when you say biological, are you saying that it could be inherited? Genetic. Genetic. Yep. Genetic. Yeah. That's why Children are predisposed. Right. So you can't maybe somehow pinpoint, a child can't pinpoint, and, and they are verbal, that sometimes it could be a result of just from your family yes yes likely another factor could be an underlying you know another mental health condition or a neurodevelopmental condition that's also impacting how they're functioning in the world so that can that could exacerbate uh, anxious symptoms perhaps in a three-year-old so a lot of factors no there <laughs> no on the contrary on the contrary it's <laughs> a good question some things are scary anyway, right? right? Yes. Like going somewhere new, and then don't let them go, or you don't model that, oh, it's going to be okay, and they go see that they survive for a couple days. I don't know. I just think some things are naturally scary, and then some things, you know, I don't know. Beyond but, what? But I, but I, I think about that the, the image that Jennifer showed us earlier about, you know, when a child's feeling aroused, their, 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 their anxiety levels are elevating. There is that tendency to want to avoid certain things or people or places. And, but if they're able to tolerate, to, to stick, it, stick to it, even if it's for a little bit, they're gaining a little bit of like, they're, they're, they're grounding themselves in the experience and they're creating a new experience. And see, this is the, the, the important part, the part where we can help children to, to change what's going on in here. And it's, sometimes it's through experience. It's through the actual, like, let's stick through it. We can get through this together. And if they can do that, then they're reconnecting the neural pathways in the brain. And they're creating a new experience. And they can conquer anxiety by learning how to stick through it. I remember an example of my daughter. I was welding. Welding. And she was like, you know, curious. Yeah. And she came over and she was like, Daddy, do you think I can do it? And she was five. And I was like, oh, mm. oh my God. <laughs> what should I say? And I was like, are you sure you want to try this? Yeah, it looks interesting. But she got scared when she started. Oh, see those far. sparks? Yeah. yeah. That's very yeah. unexpected. And I told her, well, it's either... That's very unexpected. You want to keep trying or yeah. you, you, 
quit trying. Yeah. And she said, well, I want to keep trying. And she kept doing it. <laughs> yeah, good and for her. And, that, that and now she's like an arc welder with like the, with like the, the <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Uh, one thing I would like to share as well, your example, like my son was exactly like that. He's nine. But when he was going to school uh, at around four years of age, he was exactly like that. It took a year for him to the point where he hates weekends because he can't go to school on the weekends. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Came a long way, but it goes over. Yeah. Yeah. So, so talking about coping skills then, um, so some of the main coping skills that we want to teach in therapy and support out of therapy are helping the child to develop the ability to calm down physically. In our bodies, there is, like we mentioned, there's that arousal, that, that production of hormones and, and adrenaline, which is caused by the sympathetic nervous system. But there's, a, there's an opposite to that. It's called the, paras, the parasympathetic nervous system. And that's responsible for rest and digestion and sex. But what, what that part of the nervous system does, imagine anxiety is like a flame. The parasympathetic nervous system is the water that douses it. And it helps us return back to baseline. Another coping skill that's important is the ability to talk through a situation, whether that's self-talk like, I'm going to be fine, I'm going to make it, I'm not going to die. Or talking to somebody and getting that feedback from other people. And another coping skill is the ability to problem solve in the moment. To look at different perspectives and possibilities and to create a plan B, which is not escape. <laughs> So part of the activities that we can do and help our children to learn how to do are the following. Body relaxation strategies, which include uh, the awareness of physical signs of anxiety, like we mentioned earlier, all the symptoms in the body. We can help children develop the, the ability to, to breathe not from the chest, but from the diaphragm. So diaphragmic breathing. Uh, the way I kind of taught my son to do it is, uh, hey buddy, I want you to imagine like you're pushing your belly out as you're breathing in. And then as you, you breathe out, like suck it in, right? So it's, it's remembering to breathe from here, not up here. I find that when, when people focus too much up here is when we tend to hyperventilate. So therefore, we, we shift the focus from there to down here. And an, a way that, that I also learned to, when deep breathing is to grab your right hand, put it over your heart, and put your left hand over your belly. So right hand over your heart, left hand over the belly. And, and as, you're, as you're deep breathing, you could do this either sitting down or laying down. You could kind of look down on your hands as you're breathing deeply and notice how your, your hand is rising and going down, kind of like the ocean and the waves are kind of rising and going down. It's also very important, your voice. Very important to talk very slowly, clearly, because you don't want to talk like this to them because that'll, that might make them a little bit more anxious. Yes? I was just going to ask, so do you recommend trying to teach these strategies when they're in a moment of anxiety and they're, you know, meltdown? No. Melt no. No, it's not going to work. Right. It's not going to happen because a child is dysregulated. They're in a hyper sense of arousal. And it's very difficult for the child's rational brain to turn on. In fact, some people think that when a child um, gets aroused and gets um, anxious, the cognitive parts of the brain shut down. And the, the, the midbrain takes over. Remember, the body is in fight or flight mode. It's only thinking, I got to get out of here and survive. And so they're not thinking logically. They're not thinking strategically or rationally. So it may be that maybe hold on to that idea and wait. Wait for the natural 
progression of these hormones to, to exit or to change. Once the child is able to stabilize, then we could talk more rationally. But I don't, I don't think, I don't know if, if talking to them is really going to help. If anything else, it might make them more anxious. I, I have my, my yeah. therapy clients practice. So if, if we're working towards reducing anxiety in one area, I make them practice every night and I have them report back to me. So we want to get them in the habit of making this become natural and innate. So yeah. they, they automatically do it almost in an unconscious way when they're put into a fearful situation. Yeah. Another way I like to think about it is this is like a, a muscle. And we could develop this muscle if we practice on a regular basis. Um, I am not a psychiatrist, so I cannot prescribe medication. But I am a psychotherapist, and I can prescribe <coughs> meditation. <laughs> yes. Yeah, for general kids, uh, what is the best way? You may be covering later to make them a habit kind of thing. Sometimes it is very hard, even for the others. Whether You're right. Meditating or breathing, example. Yeah. Kids like a nine-year-old or eight-year-old or ten-year-old. What are there any tips? Yeah. It's, it's not going to work when the right. situation happens. Exactly. That's yeah. why we want to practice with them. We want to practice. Well, personally, I would, if I'm working with a child, I would encourage the family and the child to work on this like early in the morning or as soon as right before they go to school or right before they're going to do um, some type, they're going to go to some function or some situation. I would have them practice before we go just so they can set the intention and prepare their bodies and their mind for what to expect later on in the day. Um, but it's, it's, a good, it's a good habit to, to, to practice on throughout the day because you don't want to also get used to just doing it in the morning. You want to do it throughout the day, spread it out so that the body doesn't get used to just doing it at a certain time of the day. Because like, I don't know if somebody mentioned it, but like when you're in the midst of, a, of, an, of an emotional storm and you haven't practiced, you'll be unprepared to, 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 to handle these, these emotions and thoughts that are coming up. Yeah, so I have my client practice before we start session. I have my client when they leave session, if they've learned some new relaxation technique that they have to demonstrate that technique to mom or dad so that mom or dad can be on board with it. Um, so really basic breathing techniques um, and that they set themselves with a schedule to do this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Another great um, exercise is the progressive muscle relaxation skills. And what we do here is we, we try to help children to tense and release. Tense and release. Tense and release. Different, different sections of the body. A lot of times we can start with our hands and we can tell them to tighten, 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 and then let go, relax. And what we can do is we can help them like progressively work throughout their whole body so that they're learning how to tense and then let go, release the tension, right? Um, visualization is also a very important um, technique to practice with children. Um, do you have any good examples of this one, Jen? Um, there are a lot of apps out there, um, but basically, or, and even non-apps, um, guided imagery. You can print some, you just Google guided imagery, so many come up. There are wonderful, wonderful, wonderful scripts out there, like there's a hot air balloon, there's taking a stroll on the beach. So you can read this to your child just in a slow, calm manner, and it gets them to visualize and relax. Um, another aspect of visualization is a child actually visualizes puts it in their mind, like let's say they have a fear of public speaking. They get up to the front, or speaking in class, they get up to the front of the class and they're visualizing, giving a great performance, everyone's applauding. This helps sort of build their inner sense of self-efficacy, right? So uh, positive visualization is really strong. With younger children, when we're helping them to develop these deep breathing skills, we could also use visualization to help them to think about how to breathe. And we could, um, we could maybe practice with them imagining that you're, you're standing in front of a, a, a huge rose bush. And what I want you to do is I want you to pretend like you're breathing 
breathing in the, the, the scent of all the roses and then hold it. And then now imagine that you're going to blow out all your candles on your cake. So imagine that. Imagine breathing in, breathing in the roses, hold it, and then breathe out all the candles. So that's, an, that's another way that we can marriage um, the deep breathing with, with visualizing. Somebody had a, yes. Yeah, you had said that when, you know, when the child is in the midst of having anxiety yeah. or a fit, you know, yes. there's something's happening. I have found that reminding them, take a breath, interjecting, you know, think about your birthday candles, blowing those out, whatever it is, that mm -hmm. does help. And it does tend to deflect as opposed to you can't, you know, when they're having a fit or they're so worked up yeah just to help instigate you know or initialize um or initiate rather you know some of these techniques sometimes is really helpful there's a lot of great there's a lot of other different ways to manage in the moment um some people like to distract some people like to do things mm -hmm. some people like they need to walk out or they need to to maybe jump up and down um Self-soothe. Self-soothe. These fidget spinners, you know, they're amazing and they're recreated just for that same purpose. They, they keep their minds off of what they're feeling. A lot of times too is there's this hyper focus on what they're feeling in their body. And a lot of times they're just so connected to that feeling that they keep thinking about it and then it makes them feel even worse. And so to be able to, to shift their mind to something else might temporarily help. But some people also take another route of just accepting it and just accepting what it is. Okay, I'm having a panic attack. I'm having anxiety. This is happening. And naming it. Na I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quote Dan, Dan Siegel again. Name it to tame it. If you can name what you're experiencing, then you might have a little bit of control over what you're experiencing. So naming what you're feeling, like I'm feeling my hands are sweaty. I'm feeling like I'm hyperventilating. Oh, I must be having a panic attack. Yeah. So research right. shows that identifying emotions, naming emotions um, is really, really crucial for emotion regulation. Yeah. Yes. Have you tried to adopt neurolinguistic programming for kids? Ooh, NLP? Falls, you know, it's an overlap. Yes. Um, a lot of the work that we do is based on CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, and dialectical behavioral therapy. Um, a, a lot of the stuff that we're doing, we're, we're, we're trying to teach children to be aware of their thoughts, their specific thoughts that they're having, and how those are connected to the feelings and their behaviors. Um, I personally don't have that much training in NLP. Um, we're more, I'm more, personally, I'm more based on CBT and DBT. Um, so I can't really talk much to that, but I know that I have a lot of friends who are a little bit, you know, they're my age and, you know, they, they really enjoy a, a lot of the work in that. Um, here are some other um, visualization techniques that we can practice with children. I mentioned the smelling the rose bushes, blowing out candles. Um, we could also visualize um, soup breathing and bubble breathing. A lot of kids find it helpful to blow bubbles, literally. Um, it's soothing, it's helpful. Not, not for all kids. Um, I've got a client that absolutely hates it. Um, so test it out. Um, I like to blow bubbles. Yeah, it drives, it drives me bananas, but yeah. you know, everyone's different. Yeah. And what's soup breathing? <laughs> Like, imagine you have a beautiful soup in front of you. It's so warm, and you want to smell the, 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 the fragrance. And then it's too hot, so you want to blow on it before you eat it. I just made that up. I don't know if that's true. <laughs> but that's what I imagine. That's what I envision to do. Here's a little bit more details on how to do progressive muscle relaxation. Um, here are some interesting uh, ways of of conveying the idea to children, like uh, helping them to imagine that they're a tin soldier. Like, I don't know if anybody's seen the, the Wizard of Oz, but imagine what the tin soldier is like. He's rigid, 
you know, very strong. And now imagine that you're loose like a rubber band, loosey goosey, you know? Um, or you could um, have them imagine that they're a very tall statue, like the Statue of Liberty. And now imagine like you're a doll, you know? So these are some other um, ways that we could convey the idea of tensing and relaxation. Detective thinking is also very important to do. And like, as I mentioned before, you know, some children might experience anxiety and we, don't just, we just don't have enough information. We can see that they're feeling uncomfortable, but as parents, we gotta know what, what's going on. So uh, part of what we could do is we could try to help them to identify what's the worry thought, you know? Help them to examine the thought. Like, when is it, how is it that you, when is it that you feel this? Where are you when you feel this? What do you imagine is gonna, use all the W's and the, 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 the H, the H one too. Uh, but it's important for them to, to think differently about anxiety. And when we ask these examination thoughts, we're helping them to look at anxiety through different perspectives, like the when, the where, the how, who, you know, all these are linked, can be linked to anxiety. Probability is also very important. I use this. I use this one a lot. Like, um, like for example, when a child feels anxious about um, like uh, going to a, a certain place, um, and they they envision something might happen, I like to use probability, and I like to say, well, well, out of a hundred percent, how how what percentage would you give it that that's really going to happen? How do you know? How do you know? What's the probability that that's, do you have proof? Do, do you have any evidence that, that helps you to come to 100%? So once we use probabilities, we kind of move away from an all or nothing. If we can at least make it into a, a, a percentage, then we move away from this black or white thinking. Consequences is another way of, of thinking about it. If the bad thing were to happen, how bad would it really be? Would it be the end of the world? And when we, when we pose these questions, children will naturally say, probably not, no, but I still don't want to go, right? I have a comment. Yeah. Uh, I have, I'm a therapy student, so I have a kid yesterday that is super worried about the uh, North uh, Korea Missile. <laughs> Can I use that? Yeah. Little rocket man. You're right, but we are not going to worry today. Yeah. 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 That's a real threat and a real worry. Yeah, you're right. Well, um, the way I like to think about it is that for me, anxiety is a, is a disorder of the future, and depression is a disorder of the past. And what we want to do is we want to keep kids in the present moment. So when kids, when their minds are thinking way too much about what might happen, what I like to do is I, I want to help them disconnect from what might happen to what's happening right now. And what do we have control over? And help ground them in the here and now. How do we do that? We do that by the deep breathing. You know, we can't control what Kim John is going to do, but you can't control your breath. So let's work on that. Let's work on our breath. Let's, let's create awareness. Let's create some mindfulness about how you're breathing right now. Let's slow it up. Let's make it slow. Let's make it intentional. You know, a lot of times we breathe and we don't even know that we're doing it. But when we create intention, then we can kind of control the, how intense it is. And if we can do that, then it can help us to ground ourselves in the, in the here and now. You mentioned the, yes. the, the detective question before. The group yeah. Went. Have you found that asking the question "Why" is the stupidest thing to do ever? I mean, just they never—they don't know why, and then they get. You know what? I actually why. why is like the one question I actually don't like to ask. Yeah. Um, I ask any other question, but why? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That'll just lead you down a rabbit hole. <laughs> the why question. Yeah. What if? What if? What if? Yeah. That's that's actually the anxious child's favorite line. But what if that happens, dad or mom? What if this happens or what if, you know? And I don't know about answering those questions. They want you to answer that question, but the problem is, is that you're feeding into it, right? 
So I want you to imagine that anxiety is kind of like a bonfire. And what it, all those little sparks are those questions. And so every time you answer that question, you're adding another log on the anxiety flame. So instead of answering the question, maybe it's about helping them to think about the question or helping them think about the problem instead of just answering right away. In, the, in a way, it's kind of like we're avoiding, but by giving those answers, we're feeding into that anxiety. It's a never ending, it's a never ending questioning. Mm -hmm. right? I was just gonna say, maybe yeah. in the interest of time, yes. we'll probably reserve questions until the end. So we'll get through the rest of our slides and then we'll take all your questions. So thoughts matter, right Jen? They do. Yeah, they do. <laughs> What, what, what happens when something happens unexpectedly? Remember how we're all like, we, we like routine? Well, what happens if, for example, we're at home and I'm expecting mom to be there? Or, you know, it's really late and mom's not here. She hasn't called me. <gasps> what if she's been in a car accident? What if she's been kidnapped? You know, the mind goes to these automatic negative thoughts. But we can change those thoughts by shifting a little bit, by shifting perspective. See, a lot of times, children that suffer with anxiety, they're kind of stuck with that negative filter. And what we can do to help them overcome it is to challenge that way of thinking. Mom's got probably been in an accident. Is that true? How do we know that's true? Is that the only possibility? Hmm. Well, uh, maybe, maybe she's stuck in traffic. Maybe. I love maybes. Because maybe opens up the doors to different possibilities. And it helps children um, get unstuck from that very rigid, negative thought. This goes back to the visualization that I was talking about earlier. Um, I'm going to fast forward though. Um, so with facing fears, we don't want to flood children, right? We don't want to say if the child's worst fear puts them on a scale from one to 10 out of 10, we're not going to flood the child with the, the fear that gives them an anxiety score of 10. Um, and I'll get to that in a little bit. Um, but basically, you could take small steps to helping a kid overcome their fears. Um, so with one child I work with, she has a fear of the dark. So mom um, has put in a nightlight, right? She didn't just put the child to bed, turn off the light, and start exposure that way and shut the door. Um, we basically want to start with successive approximations, as we call them. Um, and you definitely want to reward your child for facing that fear. If that child went to bed with a nightlight on, slept through the night, praise the child. Positive praise goes a long way. Maybe even take them out for ice cream. You know, identify something rewarding within your means that you can do to praise your child. Um, I talked about this earlier, so I'm going to uh, skip it. But basically, you know, when the child learns over time, um, that they can enter stressful or anxiety provoking situations, the level of distress decreases with each time that they are afraid. So exposure, how does it work? Basically, if you're at home, if this is not in a therapist's office, you're basically, you're gonna start slow. You're not, like I said before, gonna flood your child in a super, super, super scary situation. Um, and I'm going back to the nightlight example. Um, or, you know, if a child, I, I work with one child who is, you know, afraid to sleep alone again. So we had mom kind of sleep next to the child for one night. Eventually mom, you know, moved the cot away. So we're starting slow. We're starting gradually until the child is basically able to sleep on her own in her own room. Um, you'll want to use relaxation and encouragement. So all those coping skills we talked about, use them in these moments, okay? Prior to bedtime in this example, or prior to going to school, whatever is causing this child anxiety. Um, and so parents have to be brave too. A lot of times kids learn how to be anxious from us, right? So as a parent, you want to model that your child can do this and that you can overcome it as well. Um, I just wanted to add, yes, sometimes please. it's important to remind children 
of those moments where they demonstrated bravery. Oftentimes when they're, when they're so worked up and worried, they forget those, those, those moments where they were able to get through it and they were able to do something that was very hard. So it's important for parents to remind kids of those moments of bravery. And yes, cel celebrate when they're able to do it. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, thank you. And again, going back to what I talked about earlier, we call this using parent, pow parent power. You're basically modeling that you're brave, uh, no anxious behaviors, obviously. Don't show your child that you're anxious about, you know, the child about to go pet the dog. Um, you wanna be gentle, you wanna encourage. Um, and when you see that the child is being brave, you want to reward it. Pay attention to that. Um, because positive reinforcement goes a really long way. I wanted to also mention really quick that um, preparation is also very important. Yes. I work, I work with a lot of children on the spectrum um, through a program called ESPA. It's the early support program for autism. And um, oftentimes uh, children with autism have difficulty adapting to change. They don't like change and change can be very difficult. And one of the things that I, I mention sometimes to families is that uh, prior to um, a change, we can help a child prepare for something that's gonna be different, whether that be moving to a new home, going to a new school, or maybe going uh, to the dentist office. I think it's very important to um, provide the child enough information so they know what to expect. Part of what drives anxiety is the unknown and the not knowing. And so it can be helpful to provide a child a little bit of information so they know what to expect and not be surprised. I just wanted to add that, That's great. sprinkle that in there. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Um, so as a parent, there are a lot of strategies you can do with the school, working with the school. You want to make sure that your teacher, all the teachers understand the child's level of anxiety, right? Um, you can also work with the school to help the child, you know, learn different study skills, adapt your study skills at home, right? Um, you can, with working the school, um, learn, you know, what are the accommodations that the school can provide to help the child who's experiencing a lot of anxiety, for example, anxiety with test taking. Um, teach the child that mistakes can be good teachers, right? That goes back to that saying, we learn from our mistakes. Um, test taking strategies, so some things are you can, you know, ensure that the child gets the specifics of the content so that they know how to study. Um, work with the child on discussing like what are different ways that you can be tested, how can we prepare for these tests, um, maybe talk to the teacher about locations to take the test. Um, practice, 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 that's a huge form of exposure, uh, practice makes perfect. Um, and in the moment, you want to identify calming and thinking strategies. So I work with a seven-year-old who has a lot, a lot, a lot of test-taking anxiety. So we have developed a, um, a breathing technique that works for her that she just goes right into right before taking a test, and it helps her quite a bit. But there are a lot of different stressful experiences that we haven't talked about. So going to a doctor or a dentist it freaks out a lot of people, right? That's pretty I normal. still do. Yeah, it's, I can't. <laughs> Current events, enough said, you brought up one example. Uh, being away from parents, so separation anxiety, um, family stressors, there are a lot of changes that happen within families and within the family structure that could be very stressful. The child may be worrying about what's gonna happen. Unexpected changes, um, fi unexpected financial changes could cause you know, changes in the family structure. That could be really stressful for the child. Um, children who tend to be, or tend to want to be perfect, tend to present with really, really, really anxious symptoms. Um, and social situations, you know, being at school, being bullied, that's super anxiety provoking. So when to seek professional help. We've sort of talked to you all about the different ways, you know, that you can help your child. But if you feel like you've tried all these strategies and they're not working, you can, you know, seek professional help. Um, Sometimes there are parent-child relationship factors that get in the way of your ability to help the child or vice versa. Sometimes 
it's normal. As parents, we have a lot of anxiety and sometimes that anxiety can get in the way of your ability to treat. Um, that goes back to David's example or the, the airplane masks, right? And if the difficulties are severe, so if it's impacting the child in such a way that they cannot go to school or cannot, you know, function at home, then it's time to get professional help. So options for help. Here at CHC or in the community, um, we do evaluation and screening. Um, therapy formats are both individual and uh, family. Um, there are skill building groups that children can be a part of. Um, a lot of these are even done at school. So social thinking, expressive language, um, or various play groups. Um, parent coaching, we do parent coaching at CHC as well, and I'm sure you can find it at other agencies in the community. Educational services, um, there's tons of other parent education classes. Um, and medication, if needed, um, can seek a medication consult. So now we want to open it up for uh, questions. Thank you. Uh, I have two questions. Three questions. Okay. <laughs> Question number one. One, also based on anxiety related to, you know, uh, inflexibility, the digital themes, the compulsive thoughts. So is there a way to stop, you know, I'm, I'm afraid that today I can teach my child to not be anxious about the dark and then about school and then about later will be SAP and the job. Can we change the thinking process of being an anxious person to a not being anxious? Can we teach them flexibility to begin with? And the other one is, are there any other treatments, like alternative treatments, diets, which are not medication, mm, okay. which help yeah. all yeah. Um, so the first one, absolutely, we can teach strategies to help children become less anxious. You know, they can become, you know, high functioning children in this world, eventually adults. Um, early intervention is super important, right? Um, not all children respond to, you know, interventions the same way, um, but there are definitely research-based, evidence-based practices that, um, that can be learned and implemented. Um, there's a lot of good, um, depending on the age of the child, um, I was, you, you just reminded me of socialthinking.com and the, the book of um, uh, Superflex is a great um, body of work that encompasses a lot of different areas of difficulty with children. And there's some books in, in that, in that um, library of books that focuses on inflexibility and, and rock brain thinking. I would encourage you, I don't, depending on your, I don't know how old the child, five, okay. Um, Typically, you could probably start with something like that. Um, that would be a little bit more for like older children, but maybe you could get started with like social stories. Um, so helping him to develop flexible thinking um, is important. Um, and how we can do that is also by um, shifting, mixing it up a little bit in our everyday social routines. So for example, if we're driving to school, um, do you take the El Camino Real or do you take another side street? The, the important, or like for dinner, for example, do we always eat pasta or can we mix it up with other fruits and vegetables? So the idea is we want to incorporate flexible thinking in many different facets of our everyday experience. The other thing that I want to touch on was on the diet. Now, I know that some people, some people, um, they tend to be very sensitive to certain dietary stuff. <laughs> Sorry, um, but some people are very sensitive. Um, there are some people that are allergic to like ragweed herbs or certain types of foods or chocolates. Um, therefore, when I work with people, I, I like to talk about diet and I ask them, what, what kind of things do you eat? Um, for example, like, do, do you eat junk food? Do you, eat, do you drink soda? Like, do you, do you drink coffee or um, caffeinated um, things? And for the most part, I, I encourage people to avoid um, caffeinated things and to to stick with more balanced diet um, was there another question that you had about diet or um, I, I'm a big fan of music I'm a big fan of art in fact today I was working with a girl who was very anxious and um, she was uh, drawing she's very cute she was drawing a sunflower and as we were talking, um, a memory came into her mind and she remembered something that happened a year ago at her school. There was a, a, 
a, a man with a gun that was outside their school. And um, I noticed that as we were drawing, she was able to talk about the experience in a very calm manner. So she wasn't aroused. She was very calm and she was just drawing and, and coloring in her sunflower. But, you know, drawing, whether that is doodling or just doing crafts and arts, any activity that is relaxing, whether it's yoga or taking a warm bath or smelling lavender oil, um, or getting a, a hug from your parent, all that helps, all of it helps. And I would encourage you to use everything at your disposal until you find what works and keep doing that. And if you do something and it doesn't work, throw it out and try something new. Yes. Uh, my son is nine. Nine. Um, he's very stubborn, very strong. Okay. Uh, once he gets mad, really mad, mm -hmm. I mean, I tried all the, all the techniques and we practice it, but when he gets mad, it's hard to bring him down, you know? So yeah. what are, what, what other strategies can we try? I see. <laughs> so a couple things that I, I, would, I would be thinking about if, if I were to see a, a child who's having such a hard time with their anger, um, I, would, I would like to help them to, to, to put it on a scale, make it visual, use a thermometer, five point scale, use a thermometer, you know, and, and help them to, to gauge where he's at, identify what level his anger is. And then what I would do is if he's able to pinpoint, then I would try to do a relaxation technique, whether that's turn on YouTube and watch a, a like a meditation video. He loves to read. I would say, let's, let's, let's take out. A, I noticed you're really, really upset, buddy. How about we grab a book that, and then read a book. And then when we're done reading for a couple moments, then go back to the thermometer and ask him again. How do you feel now? And see where he's at. And I, I, I want to guarantee it, but there's a strong possibility that it might go down. Even if it goes down a little bit, that's movement. And that's what we want. We want him to, to, to find different alternatives to expressing his anger in a positive and healthy way. Yeah. And if you find that that is not working, and if you find that it's actually getting worse, that might be time to, you know, seek some professional help. Yeah. You had a question? Yeah. 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 We talked about the gradual exposure to the fears. So, yeah. And so it makes sense of things you can do that with, like the dark or, but in social situations where it's yeah. afraid of going to school or in our case, our son loves sports. Yes. Has a panic attack every season with every new team, doesn't want to go, doesn't want to be signed up. Right? Yeah. And how do you, how do you know when to push them and when to sort of, they okay, really doesn't like that. So I, for me, I think stress is, stress is normal. Stress is good. Stress is, stress is part of growth. And I think that as you start gradually, we, we want to connect a child small. Like we don't, we don't, we, if a child's already struggling with social anxiety and, and he or she feels uncomfortable, we're setting them up for failure if we just pressure them to go into a group setting without working and developing social skills, social awareness, and coping mechanisms to deal with the, the discomfort. So I would start small. I would, smart, I would start with working with, with like maybe playing with a couple kids and just getting, making it a habit until they start feeling more comfortable with it. And then gradually like inviting other kids to it, you know? Um, I've also found that in play therapy, I use a lot of toys and I actually, I pretend I'm a dinosaur talking to another one. And, um, and I, and I, with them, I kind of create these social situations. And a lot of times kids feel more comfortable talking through, um, a toy than them talking through themselves. So I would say maybe encouraging role play, practicing with them. Um, pretending like you're maybe if it's like a like going to a store, pretending like you're a clerk, like a sales clerk, like hey, how can, how can I help you? And and having them practice with you. Mm -hmm. So and it's all you, about like role playing. Yeah. Right? If you find that you know doing any of these strategies don't 
health. And if your son is having intense panic attacks and they are not going away despite your all the efforts you've exhausted, that also might be time to, you know, get the professional help because it's likely that his anxiety has just become sort of ingrained, right? That is his natural response to panic. Yeah. And working with a therapist, we can start under or you know, he and the therapist can start working at the underlying underlining meaning of the fear um, and and skills to take so that he doesn't experience panic attacks when faced in that situation. Yeah. Yes. Um, if perfectionism is the issue, like how are you supposed to kind of like- I love this question. I love this question. Thank you very much. I love this question. I had a, I was working, um, this is also the last question that we're, we're, we're gonna be able to talk about. But I love this question because I thought about it today. I was in a, <clears throat> I, I saw two different people this week. I saw one, they're both artists. Little, they're girls and they're artists and they love art. And one girl was so worried about making it look right that she would just like crumple the paper, throw it. She wants to burn it. It's just not good enough. And then this other girl that I was working with today, she was drawing, this is the same one that was drawing the, the beautiful sunflower. And I noticed, I, I noticed that, I noticed, I didn't say it out loud, but I was like, hmm, like, I know some petals were bigger, some were wider, some were different. And I said to her, I'm not gonna tell you her name, that's confidential, but I said, I noticed that your, your sunflower looks beautiful because it's, 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 it's so different, it's unique. Do you worry that, that it's not gonna look the best? You know what she said? She said, hmm, I don't really care. As long as you, as long as you can tell that it's a flower, that's all I care about. So. I think it's about like not focusing so much on the details, but taking a step back and appreciating what it is, you know, and, and also not being afraid of getting dirty or making a mistake. You know, unfortunately, in this area that we live in, there's a lot of pressure to be perfect and to do the best. I find it ironic that when you go to these corporations and the Googles, they actually encourage failure. Right. They encourage people to fail. So I find it ironic that in high school and in elementary and middle school, where children feel so much pressure that they gotta do it the right way, the best way. But once they leave, it's, it's a whole nother ball game. I wish that we can do the same, have the same mentality of accepting and embracing failure and to learn from it and to become better from it. Thank you for bringing that up. And thank you everybody for coming today. Thank you.